there, my name is Luna and I'm here to catch you up on everything that has happened in Campaign 3 so far. You can watch my episode 1 to 24 recap right here. Episode 25, A Taste of Taldore. Bell's Hells head to the themed restaurant Taste of Taldore in Basaras with their new companion Dusk, played by Erika Ishii. All of the waitstaff are dressed in costumes of famous figures from Taldore's past, and the group enjoys some themed food and drinks as well as a visit to the gift shop. Dusk explains that she is looking for two people who helped her while she was in the Fey Realm, and she pulls out a locket with two portraits, which turn out to be Fern's parents, Ollie and Birdie Calloway. Dusk thinks that the Calloways might be in Basaras, but due to time wibble wobbles, is not sure how long it's been since she saw them. It's been 90 years years since Fern has seen her parents when they left the Fey Realm on an undefined but important mission. Imogen sends a message to Fern's mother, who is somewhat suspicious, but after mentioning some facts that only Fern would know, she is thrilled to hear from them and they arrange to meet at a local tinkerer's place, Imahara Joe's. Laudna and FCG have a heart-to-heart -heart about the fight Laudna and Imogen had, and FCG agrees to facilitate a conversation between the two. Imogen also has a heart-to-heart -heart with Aram about the fight and her feelings of jealousy, seeing Laudna and Dusk get along so well. These jealous feelings are only flamed further when Dusk asks Imogen if her and Laudna are a thing because she's been getting some vibes. Imogen awkwardly says they are not and shippers everywhere cried out. Casting locate object, FCG locates the trashy scry ring within a pawn shop or a pawn tent called the River of Renewal. Dusk casts suggested on the merchant and he tells them that Treshi is the one who pawned the ring and believes him to be hiding out at the Seat of Disdain, which is the Paragon's call headquarters here in the city. The group go and scope out the fortress with Fern, turning into a quokka and going inside to explore. She spots General Ratanish inside one of the rooms before being tossed out by one of the Paragon's call guards. Episode 26 hidden truths. Over a long rest, Dusk encourages Fern to live her true, untamed Fey Realm self and to not let herself be put inside a box. She says that she feels like Fern is family since she knows Birdie and Ollie so well. But, unbeknownst to the rest of the party, Dusk is psychically contacted by someone called Sorrow Lord Zathuda, bearer of the Lightless Flame and Grove Captain of the Unseely Court. The Sorry Lord asks for a report on the progress of Dusk's secret mission to recover the Moontide Crown and deal with the Callaways. Dusk, who has a completely different demeanor than the one we have seen so far, says that they will get the job done. That night, Imogen dreams again of the Red Storm, this time beginning completely engulfed by it. She again sees an unfamiliar figure with short gray hair and dark armor, this time surrounded by dozens of other figures in similar armor. They all rush towards her and she wakes up to see the Red Moon Ruidus flaring overhead, flashing with a red light for a brief moment and she feels a sense of longing. In the morning, the group are visited by members of the Paragon's call as they were noticed loitering outside the Seat of Disdain. The party convinces the call members that they are looking for work and they arrange to meet with General Ratanish within the day. The party then split up to look for potential allies. Aram and Laudner keep an eye on the Seat of Disdain where they spot Treshi taking a smoke break. Ashton, Chetney and Imogen go to the All Minds Burn, which seems to be a drug den where members can communicate and think together like a hive mind. There they meet Ashton's old friend Justy Pross and Icefuro who tells them that the best way to get inside the Seat of Disdain is to compete in the Death Wish Run a dangerous race on crawlers around the city. FCG, Fern, and Dusk go to a scrap shop that FCG used to visit called Finders Takers. There they meet the owner, Esma, who tells FCG that she saw Dancer a month ago, revealing to FCG that Dancer is still alive. However, she did have a new metal prosthetic arm. This news shakes FCG, who can remember watching Dancer die. The group all then meet up at Imahara Joe's, a character created in tribute to Grant Imahara, and they arrange to rent two crawlers. Joe tells Fern that her parents have been customers for a few years, and they come in every few months. In particular, they have been buying arcane cores, which draw power from the ley lines and function as batteries. Joe also tells FCG that he almost bought FCG for himself when the trader came through town, but Dancer beat him to it. This is also contradictory information to FCG, who has always believed the dancer built him. However, Joe explains that FCG is an Aeormaton, a sentient automaton from the fallen city of Aeor, a race of people that had long been dormant but are waking up more and more in the last few years. Fern recognizes the name Aeor and shows a postcard that she has from her parents from that city where she believes they visited as part of their mission. Episode 27, A Race for the Prize. That evening, FCG examines Fern's postcard and she comes to the realization that her Nana Mori may have written them herself and pretended that they were from her parents to spare her feelings. Aww. Imogen attempts to have a conversation with Laudna, but Dusk inserts herself, asking Laudna on a date and stirring up more tension. Laudna awkwardly says that she'll think about it and then goes to find Imogen where the two do have a heart to heart and reconcile. Imogen gives Laudna a gift of a ruby snake ring and the shippers everywhere all cheered. Following the revelation the dancer is alive, FCG has been acting a little strangely, getting people's names wrong and mixing up details. The stress of everything seems to be getting to them. Meanwhile, Aram and Dusk talk about the similarity of their tattoos and fighting styles, and they have a sparring match with Aram winning. Dusk is flirty and asks Aram out, but he says no since he is gay and he also still has unrequited feelings for his husband Will, who died in the Air Ashari attack seven years ago. 
Fern shows Chetney a green gem that her nana gave her that she is supposed to give to her parents. It's why she left the Fey Realm in the first place. It's enchanted, but she doesn't know what it's for, only that it's very important. The next day, they pick up a bomb they commissioned from Finder's Takers, and Ashton, Chetney, Laudner, Dusk, and Fern, who is wild-shaped into a rat, meet with General Ratanish and request some work. He says they need to ask his boss, the leader of the Paragon's Call, and introduces a woman with grey hair. The same woman Imogen has been dreaming about, but Imogen isn't there to see her! Her name is Odahan Thule, and Ashton recognises her as a famous war hero from the Apex War. Ratfern does some snooping about and sees a backpack contraption with two glass containers plugged into it underneath Odahan's cloak. Odahan says she might have work for the group if they can prove themselves in the Death Wish run at dusk, so they head back to Joe's who shows them how to drive the crawlers and explains the rules of the race, or the lack thereof. The group will have two crawlers and Joe warns them to be wary of traps and competing teams interfering. Episode 28, The Death Wish Run. The race begins underneath the bone tree in the skids. There are six crawlers in the race, including Bell's Hells 2. They name one the Red Moon, which has Ashton and Imogen, and the other the Buckfucker with Chetney and Laudner, and FCG installed as a front wheel. Truly an unhinged plan. Dusk and Aram stake out one of the hairpin turns and Fern hangs out in the sidelines to run interference from there. As the race is about to begin, Imogen spots Odahan Thule and recognises her as the woman from her dream. The race kicks off and it is a violent, bloody affair with the crawler gangs attacking one another and trying to get them out of the race. FCG casts spirit guardians in the form of turtle shells in an homage to Mario Kart. The buckfucker gets slowed down by a wire net which Chetney tears apart in his wolven form and Imogen casts blindness on a driver who then drives their crawler off the side of the ravine. Dusk and Aram leap onto another crawler and manage to commandeer it while Aram and Ashton together manage to destroy the Paragon's Call Crawler. Paragon's Call Crawler. <laughs> Try saying that ten times. As they drive through a cave they are attacked by a creature called a Kagarunk which knocks Laudner unconscious. Ashton manages to kill the creature and Dusk heals Laudner using Lay on Hands revealing that she has paladin abilities. Back in the sidelines, Fern notices some barricades being set at the finish line, so she uses her stonky's ring to move them out of the way, and then falls into the portable hole as she tries to use it. The buckfucket makes it through the barricade, and Bell's Hells are announced the winners. Odahan and Ratanish are pleased with their success and give them quarters in their seat of disdain, saying they've got a job. They return to Imahara Joes, who performs some repairs on FCG, who was looking very beat up after the race and being the wheel of the crawler. That night, while they are resting, Chetney tells Dusk he believes she's a bounty hunter looking for the Calloways, but Dusk denies it. Chetney insists that that he will help her, but Dusk still continues to deny it. Dusk then describes this offer to Fern, who brushes it off. Imogen tries to read Dusk's mind, but finds it to be completely protected. The next day, the group meet Fern's mother at Imahara Joe's, who drops the shocking bombshell that for her it has only been six years, rather than the 90 years that Fern experienced. Then Dusk reveals their true form, a changeling who grabs both Fern and Birdie. Birdie looks to Fern and says, you've led them right to us. Episode 29. Dark Portents. Dusk's true form is revealed they are Yusufayid, a changeling spy of the Unseelie Court, and they are on a mission to retrieve the Moontide Crown from the Calloways. Birdie goes invisible and tells Fern to run, Aram holds Yu at sword point, and Yu tells Fern that her parents are liars and thieves, that they have stolen something which has thrown the Seelie and Unseelie Courts into disarray, and not only that, but Birdie is lying about the fact that it's only been six years. Birdie denies this and swears that it has only been six years since she left Fern, later surmising that Nana Mori wanted to spend more time with Fern and magically extended time in her domain in the Fey Realm. Distrust abounds and Birdie explains that Fern was born in Exandria while Ruidus fled, making her Ruidus born. After they brought Fern back to the Fey Realm, the Red Moon began appearing in the sky where it had never appeared before. This somewhat explanation wins Fern's trust who goes to attack you, but you manages to talk her down saying that more assassins will come and that they can provide answers. Imogen then cast Detect Thoughts on Birdie, learning that she has been working with Ira, the Nightmare King, causing the party to mistrust her even further. Birdie tries to explain that even though Ira is a bad guy, they are working on something together for the greater good, something to try and determine the true nature of Ruidus. They have been working on this ever since Fern's father, Ollie, started having visions of Ruidus consuming everything. The Calloways learned that the Unseelie Court have been working with people from Exandria, Odahan Thule, and an unidentified older elven man in blue robes to build a device related to Ruidus, something that they assume to be bad since the Unseelie have been using Ruidus to gain boons. The Calloways took an integral component of the machine, the Moontide Crown, and used it in their own machine. They are trying to get this machine finished before the Apogee Solstice, which is only a month away, and they are working with a person called Hondir who has also been concerned about Ruidus for some time. Chetney proposes a deal to you. Give the Calloways one month to use the crown and then it is returned along with Fern's parents. Yu agrees, but not before trying to convince Fern to return to the Fey Realm with them. This is tempting for Fern, but ultimately she chooses to stay with her friends. Then Yu very dramatically departs, saying that they will be back. Fern takes out the green gem that Mari gave to her and FCG identifies it as a weave lens, which can be used to view the magical essence of things. Birdie explains that Ira requested Mari create this item. 
She also confirms that Mori is not Fern's biological grandmother, but a friend that they trusted to take care of her. They all head to meet Hondir at a hideout he has established in the city, which is rigged with explosives, just in case. Hondir is a member of the Grim Verity, an organization who has been researching Ruidus. He has been studying the ley lines, lines of magical energy that cross all over Exandria, and at ley line intersections, great magics can be made. Lately, the ley lines have been shifting as we get closer to the Apogee Solstice. Hondir explains that an Apogee Solstice is a powerful event occurring every 200 years or so, where the ley lines can be changed altogether and their power harnessed for extraordinary things. However, he and other members of the Grim Verity are in danger. Many of their members, including the Loomis twins, have been murdered by Grey assassins. Almost half of the Grim Verity has been assassinated in the last few years. Homde also reveals that recently the Grim Verity stole hidden text in the Taldori city of Vasselheim, which referred to a time when Ruidus did not exist in the sky, only Cartha. The text also spoke of two gods who once existed as part of the Pantheon but no longer do. The Grim Verity think that these gods and Ruidus are connected. Vasselheim has seemingly kept this knowledge secret for centuries, so they are trying to get the text back. Homdir also knew Imogen's mother, Liliana Temelt, as she was a volunteer in a study at the Omen Archive at the Aidenland Seminary in Eos. This study was on Ruidus born and he last saw her around 12 years ago. The group decide they want to see this machine for themselves and speak to Ira, so they board their crawlers and head out to the Callaway Layaway. Episode 30, Reunion and Revelation. On the way to the Callaway Layaway, they are ambushed by a crawler gang called the Fist of the Ruiner, but they manage to kill some of them and run the others off. Upon arriving at the hideout, they see that it has been decorated with lush plant life, which have been able to grow inside these caves thanks to the effect of purple rocks, now rocks which are hanging about the cavern. Birdie says that they have to be careful not to touch them, and we have seen previously the negative impact that one seemingly had on Imogen. Fern is reunited with her father Ollie, and they have an awkward reunion with Ira at the Nightmare King as he is working on a large telescope-like device. Fern hands over the green gem, which he places inside the telescope. This allows them to see the weave of magic and the ley lines. As Ira continues working on the telescope, Ollie explains that the Moontide Crown gave him some powers such as dark vision, powers drawn from the moon, and the ability to create illusions. This crown is an integral component of the telescope. With the telescope now ready, Imogen and Aurum look through it and see a lattice around Ruidus, like a cage very much like the Divine Gate, which keeps the Prime Deities separated from the Material Plane. And then, through red, swirling clouds on the surface of Ruidus, they see a gleaming city. What the f***? Episode 31 Breaking point. Imogen shares with Ira the magical weave she saw, but she doesn't tell him about the city. He says he built the Unsealy Court machine and reveals that the Unsealy Court have been working with Ludinus Dalath, a mage from the Cerberus Assembly in Wildmount and a prominent NPC from Campaign 2. Ira talks in riddles, saying that he wants to see the Unsealy Court fail and that now that the Calloways have been found, he has to leave, and he vanishes along with the Moontide Crown. Imogen tells Homdir about the city she and Aram saw and the lattice around the moon, which he deduces to be similar to the Divine Gate. The party then theorize about what it could be for and think it could be for imprisoning the two forgotten gods from the Vasselheim texts. Aurum removes the green gem and Ashton, wrongly believing that magic items are indestructible, destroys it with their hammer, much to the horror of the entire group and everybody watching. Lord amends it but it is no longer enchanted. The group rifle through Ira's things and find some gems, some blank paper and a trade route map with lines pointing towards a location east of Bassaras. They believe this to be the Unsealy Court base of operations. So far there has been some explanation from Fern's parents about what happened but there are also rather large gaps in their memory, so they allow FCG and Imogen to examine Ollie's mind. There they discover that the memories have been altered over and over again, probably by Ira to stop them from going home to Fern, as one fragmented memory seems to show. Even though it seems like it was not their fault, Fern is very angry at her parents, and the others encourage her to feel her feelings, that it's okay for her to feel angry and abandoned, and this encourages her to sit down and share these feelings with her parents, who apologize and promise to try and make it up to her. Imogen casts Sending to Aurum's leader on his behalf, Keyleth, of the Arashari, updating her on their discoveries. Keyleth says she will continue to research things on her end. FCG also casts a sending to Dancer, asking for her status, but she just replies scared and asking how he found her. Fern takes two of the Nile rocks and puts one inside Lordna's dollhouse and the other in Imogen's bag. In the morning, as Lordna finds the rock in the dollhouse, she once again hears Delilah's voice in her mind, so Imogen takes the rock and smashes it against the wall. Aurum tells Imogen about the rock in her bag, but she doesn't take it out. FCG again attempts to contact Dancer, but again she is scared and angry and just tells FCG to leave her alone. This is very distressing for FCG who powers down, becoming catatonic. Chetney hits him on the head in an attempt to turn him back on, which does work, but FCG snaps and starts attacking his friends and saying hurtful things. 
The group gang up on him to knock him unconscious and they hang him from the ceiling in case he wakes up in a murderous mood again. When he does wake up, he doesn't remember what happened. Ashton realizes that FCG must have been the one-eyed creature who murdered his party as when he found FCG, he had a damaged eye unit. It seems like when FCG takes on stress, it builds up and up and up until they snap. With that incident behind them, they return with Birdie to Basaras. Episode 32. A stage set. Fern says goodbye to Birdie and the two agree to keep in touch. Imogen sends a message to Dancer claiming that they have captured her automaton and asking to meet up. Dancer agrees and meets with Aram and Imogen while the rest wait outside. Dancer reveals that they bought FCG from a travelling merchant who wears a metal mask and that she worked to bring him back online. They became a group of adventurers until FCG, who had been having a stressful time in the lead up to this incident, turned on the group, killing everyone except for Dancer who managed to escape. Dancer reluctantly agrees to see FCG who apologises. She can't forgive him but she also also says she understands that it wasn't totally his fault. At FCG's request, she shares a way to shut him down should it happen again, pull out a glowing cable inside him to sever the connection to his power core. She says that Joe might have more info about the masked merchant and leaves. They head to Joe's, who tells them that the trader goes by D and is very tall and wears a metal mask. They trade and sell ancient automaton pieces. Joe agrees to look inside FCG and he finds that everything appears to be working as normal, but he does think that the attack may have happened because FCG might be an aeomaton from the event called the Care and the Culling an event in which AR sent a number of helper Aeomatons to various political figures and these Aeomatons were programmed to turn on and murder their masters. This is very distressing to FCG but Joe encourages him to find his own path, gifting him a coin of the Changebringer who can act as a guide. The group head to the Seat of Disdain for their meeting with Odahan Thul. On the way they bump into the bounty hunter Artana Vo who they assume is here looking for Treshi. Arriving at the Seat of Disdain, the group are given a tour, some uniforms and a job loading crates which Ashton realises are the same as those he saw in Gianna Hexum's house. There are also two metal boxes with the stamp of the Cerberus assembly. FCG casts Locate Creature on Treshi and senses him in the basement below when all of a sudden there are the sounds of an attack on the Seat of Disdain. Episode 33 blood and dust. The attack is well underway so Chetney, Aram and Imogen race downstairs to try and grab Treshi. They find him in a well-appointed cell in the basement but Artana Vo has gotten there first. After some scraps and scrapes, Aram convinces her to work with them and they take Treshi upstairs where General Ratanish finds them. The group then immediately abandon Artana who turns invisible and escapes. Meanwhile, Lordna climbs up to the balconies of the fortress searching for a high-ranking Paragon's call member that she can plant the Treshi tracking ring on and she comes face to face with Odahan Thul. She manages to plant it in Odahan's backpack before escaping. Ashton and Fern grab some of the wooden crates and one of the metal boxes and FCG commandeers a crawler. The group rendezvous and get on the crawler, heading out into the street where they are confronted by none other than Odahan Thul. She recognizes Imogen and by probing Aram's mind, learns that they work for Lord Eshteros. She then summons Dunamis Echoes from her backpack and combat begins. It is a brutal fight with Bell's Hells attempting to run, but she is too fast and between her and her Echoes, Ashton, Aram, Fern and Lordna are knocked out, although Lordna is brought back to one hit point by Delilah. Odahan is using both Psy Warrior abilities and Echo Knight abilities powered by her Dunamancy backpack. Odahan calls to Imogen, baiting her, and Imogen flies out to face her. Odahan then attacks Aram, killing him, and as he dies, he thinks of Will and Derig. Then directly after, she kills Fern, who thinks to herself, that was one hell of a ride, as she dies. This whole time, Odahan is just baiting Imogen, trying to convince her to open herself up to her powers and to unleash them, and Imogen feels a growing storm inside of her that becomes harder and harder to control. As she continues to resist, Odahan attacks Lordner, who fails two death-saving throws, and Imogen unleashes everything, creating a huge storm that tears the very buildings away, and everything goes white. Episode 34 what dreams may come. As Bell's Hells exist in a white abyss, they have flashes of memory. FCG has memories of a parade of automatons, just like him. A grey-haired man and a nice older woman. Chetney remembers relationships from his youth, and Ruid is feeding his desire to hunt and kill. Ashton remembers seeing their parents standing before a glowing portal, his father wearing a Hashari headdress. And Lordna remembers the Briarwood feast the night before she died. Imogen remembers being very young and being with her mother, before she sees Odahan, who tells her she must accept her faith and master her powers. She again tries to convince Imogen to join her, but Imogen manages to blast her away somehow and finds herself on the street outside the Seat of Disdain once again, surrounded by rubble and destruction. Marisha immediately rolls a death saving throw for Lordner and rolls a natural one. She is dead. Delilah tells her, death is but a waiting game. FCG casts Revivify on Fern and then the group grapple with whether they should choose Lordna or Aram as they can only revive one more person and in the end, reasoning that Lordna has come back before and maybe she will again, they choose Aram. Fern casts Revivify on him and as his spirit leaves, 
Whatever afterlife there is, he tells his husband Will that he will see him again. They take Laudner's body and rush to Imahara Joe's where he lets them hide out in the basement. There they interrogate Treshi, unleashing a lot of their anger and frustration on him, and he explains that he and Ira were attempting to cause chaos in Drusar so that the Paragon's call would be brought in to handle things. Treshi has been helping smuggle Dunamancy potions for Odahan, and when they open up the crates they do indeed find these potions, and inside the lockbox is Residuum, a powerful substance used in spell components that comes from Whitestone. Whilst they are trying to rest, a group of Paragon's call members comes to Joe's investigating, but the Bell's Hells are able to hide in a side tunnel until they leave. FCG casts gentle repose on Laudner, feeling that he stopped something from happening, potentially Delilah trying to take over her body. Imogen messages Lord Estros, who says to bring Laudner back to Drusar, where hopefully they can find someone to help, so they board the skyship and leave Basaras. Episode 35 Pyrrhic return. Bell's Hells bring Treshi out of the portable hull and he offers them 10,000 gold to let him go, but they stand firm and lock him away in a mouldy storage room aboard the skyship. Imogen contacts Keyleth, who says she can meet them shortly and that they should pick a tree. That night, while they are resting, Chetney goes up to the deck and begins to howl uncontrollably at the moon, suddenly beginning to transform into a wolf before the urge subsides and he returns to his gnomish self. The next day, the ship encounters a sandstorm and the group are thrown off of it after tussling with some kind of large pincered sand creature they get back on and head for Drasar. They arrive at Lord Estoros's manor who has fortified his home with even more traps. They show him Treshi and he suggests taking him to Mistress Shashadri since she is the one offering a bounty for him, but he also rewards them with 800 platinum. They discuss what to do with Lordna and Estoros suggests bringing her to Manaya to Rai who oversees an interior forest since she might be able to help with transportation to Keyleth. It's at this time that Orem also shares that when his father-in-law and husband were killed in the attacks, any attempts to revive them failed due to a toxin that interferes with divine divine resurrection, so there is some concern that they might not be able to bring Laudna back. They then set off to deliver Treshi to Mistress Shashadri, who confirms that Ira, the Nightmare King, was working with Treshi to cause chaos throughout Drissar. They explain everything they learned about the Paragon's call and the Cerberus assembly, but since they have no proof, she is skeptical, although she does say she'll look into it. She pays them the 12,000 gold bounty, cha-ching, and they head off to the Spire by Fire to get some rooms. Ashton asks Imogen and FCG to use their mind reading abilities to look into his mind, since he is missing memories around the botched break-in at Hexham's Manor. They do so and see visions of Ashton breaking in with the nobodies, finding the crates and inside those crates crystal vials of dunamancy potions, and then glowing sigils begin to light up around the room that then explode with force, pushing Ashton out and off the balcony. When they try and go deeper into that memory, something very strange happens. Imogen can't get any further and instead appears to be trapped inside glass. FCG, however, sees Milo working on Ashton trying to save their life, pulling out a dunamancy potion and just pouring it into Ashton's head wound. As the potion hits Ashton's head, Imogen finds herself floating in a starry sky and seeing different forms of Ashton, different versions of their life, different possibilities. FCG, while inhabiting Ashton's body in these memories, realizes that they experience chronic pain, everything hurts, everywhere, all the time. Imogen and FCG realize that they can't get out until Imogen commands Ashton to wake up. Later, Imogen reaches out to Delilah with sending, asking how to revive Laudna. Delilah responds faintly like she's far away and says that Imogen has to do whatever it takes. Laudna is fading and Delilah will take her with her. The next day, they seek out Manaya to Rai, but before she is able to send them anywhere, a portal opens in a nearby tree and Keyleth emerges, agreeing to take Laudna to someone who can help. Episode 36, A Desperate Call. They travel through Keyleth's portal and arrive at Whitestone, entering through the Sun Tree. They go to Whitestone Castle, where they meet Lord Percival de Rollo and his tiefling daughter Gwendolyn, as well as Pike Trickfoot and Vexalia de Rollo. The situation is explained to Vox Machina, and Vex realizes that Laudna was the Sun Tree victim dressed to look like her, which shakes her but also makes her more determined to help. Pike begins a resurrection ritual and discovers that there are two souls bound to Laudna's body. Laudna's soul and Delilah's soul. Percy refuses to let the resurrection continue if there is any chance of Delilah returning, and as he storms off, Ashton follows and has an argument with him, but is still unable to convince him. Pike, however, knows of a spell that may be able to separate the two souls. She will cast astral projection on the group so that their souls can enter a spirit realm and expunge Delilah from Laudna's body. FCG is unsure if they have a soul, so Pike, using divine magic, takes a peek and confirms that yes he does. The party gear up and get ready and Imogen gives the purple narwhal that Fern put in her bag to Pike for investigation and safekeeping. Whew. Pike casts Astral Projection and they find themselves in a wood in front of a hut which becomes surrounded by shadowy spirits who whisper to kill the witch. Inside the hut they see a shadowy figure with a purple light. This is Laudna who vanishes once the malevolent spirits approach. Bell's Hells fend them off and find a tunnel underneath the floorboards of the hut which leads them to Whitestone. 
but not as it is in real life. Instead, it moves and is a twisted configuration of the true city, and in the center, the sun tree is dead with bare, leafless branches. Episode 37 from the bowels. Bell's Hells walk through the shadowy white stone and as they do, bones erupt from the ground, blocking their path and making it harder to get to the center of the city. Ashton chips off a piece of bone, which starts to bleed. Gross. <laughs> in an alley, they spot Laudna's spirit again, but in her youth, and she is talking to a young boy who wants to play secret treasure with her. She has to tell him a secret and then he will give her a present. He calls Laudna's spirit Matilda. Matilda refuses and he throws dirt in her eyes and he walks away, vanishing. Imogen speaks telepathically with Matilda and they find her playing in a barn covered in creeping vines. This version of Matilda is even younger and she is playing with handmade dolls, one a woman and the other a bird. Matilda tells them that the mean woman won't let her leave and that beyond the city, is just blackness. While they are talking to her, the creeping vines have surrounded the entire barn and blocked the exit. Matilda disappears and the party blast their way out of the barn with a stick of dynamite. This time they find Matilda in her home, getting ready with her parents for a dinner. Imogen speaks with her psychically, warning her that something bad is going to happen and that she can come and find them and they will bring her home safe. As Matilda heads upstairs, her spirit parents attack with Chetney and Ashton finishing them off. They make their way to the sun tree and Delilah Briarwood appears swirling with purple shadows and Lorna is trapped inside the branches of the tree. Bell's Hells speak with Delilah who says that they have two options. They can revive Lorna, with Delilah's soul attached, or they can let her die, and she will just find another way to return. Chetney insists that they be allowed to talk to Laudna, so Delilah lowers her cage. Imogen tells her that they're going to save her and attacks Delilah. Roll initiative! Delilah summons skeletal minions, which FCG destroys with Channel Divinity, and then FCG is knocked unconscious and his spirit leaves the fight, returning to the real Whitestone. Due to the nature of the spell, he can't come back and he is fully out of the fight. Imogen uses a new feat, calling on the power of Ruidus, dealing both damage to herself and Delilah, and then Fern, realizing that damaging the tree also hurts Delilah, uses her fire powers to set it ablaze. Oram tries to get to Laudna up in the tree, but Delilah knocks him out, knocking him out of the fight. The combat ends when Imogen casts lightning bolt on the tree, splitting it down the middle. Delilah screams out, Laudna's spirit is freed, and they all wake up. Hello, please excuse my disheveled state. I uh, have been in full goblin mode editing this video for many, many hours now. But I wanted to jump on and say thank you so much to my patrons who really uh, support me to make this video and to remind you that it's very easy uh, to support this channel. If you'd like to do so, you can do, you can do so. <laughs> I'm so tired. If you'd like to do so, you can for just $5 a month and you get exclusive behind the scenes content, Patreon only live streams, and we're almost at 150 patrons. It would be awesome to reach that goal. I think maybe we'll do like a little patron only game night or movie night or something to celebrate. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash Luboffin. It would mean the world to me, especially after uh, trying to finish this <laughs> huge, huge video. Okay, that's all. Back, back, oh. <laughs> back to the video. Episode 38. Dark Balance. Using divine magic, Pike senses that while the connection between Delilah and Laudna has been weakened, there is still a small connection and a chance that Delilah could come back. However, they decide to risk it with Vex, Percy, and the forces of Whitestone on guard. Pike begins the ritual, and Aurum is the first to contribute, blooming red poppies in Laudna's hair and telling her that she is more than a footnote in Delilah's story. FCG then casts compulsion on Laudna, saying that he can't let her leave, but the spell fails. Imogen is last, and she gives a truly heartbreaking speech, telling Laudna Laudna how much she loves her and that she will fill any hole Delilah leaves behind. There was not a dry eye in the house. It's also very unfortunate that these highly emotional episodes always seem to fall on Halloween. With the ritual complete, Laudna is alive! Huzzah! Laudna is disturbed to realize that she is in Whitestone, but has a healing moment at the Sun Tree where she takes on a new form of dread with branches sprouting from her shoulders and leaves showing the changes of the season. Laudna and Percy have a somewhat awkward conversation and Fern tries to steal Pike's holy symbol because of course she does. Laudna takes out Pate, her dead rat puppet, and casts Fine Familiar, and this time it actually comes to life, introducing my favorite NPC that Matthew Mercer plays. The Dorollos invite them to dinner, where Percy tells FCG about Tarion and Dodie from Campaign 1, and Fern requests a mini gun for Mr., which astoundingly Percy agrees to. There is a lot of information exchange, and before the group splits, Vex apologizes to Laudner for what happened to her and gives her a ring of protection. That night, Bell's Hells take their long rest underneath the sun tree, and FCG 
cast Cher dream with Imogen. In the red storm, Imogen sees a masculine figure turn away and move into the storm, and Imogen is worried it is Lord Estoros and that he has just died. As she and FCG move through the storm, she realizes that she is not by her home, as she usually is in these dreams, and as the storm begins to die down, they see an endless void of stars, they are on the moon. Well, I mean, it's not confirmed that they're on the moon, but like, they're on the moon. The next morning, Imogen messages Lord Estoros, but she gets no response. After a quick trip to Gilmore's Glorious Goods, the Whitestone branch, and a quick trip for FCG to the Changebringers Temple, they teleport back to Drasar. They arrive at Estoros' home to find a bloodbath, traps set off everywhere, pools of blood, and in his bedchamber, Lord Estoros dead. He was killed using the toxin that prevents resurrection, and Chetney can smell Odahan Thule has been in the room. Chetney finds a lockbox, which he manages to open, and inside are some letters from Estoros addressed to various figures, as well as one to Bell's Hells, leaving them his maple ginger biscuit recipe, and the skyship, the Silver Sun. Episode 39, The Momentum of Murder. Bell's Hells retire to the Spire by Fire, where they are reeling from the death of their patron. They take some time to check in with Laudner, who tells them that her original name was Matilda Bradbury, but as she spent so much time alone following her death, she forgot who she was. She would sing to Pate, la la la, and it became Laudner. She discovers she still has access to her warlock powers, but she doesn't know if they are coming from Delilah or coming from somewhere else. Imogen sends a message to Mistress Shashadri telling her about Estoros' murder, and she says she will meet them at their room. However, instead she sends the Green Seekers, Gus and Ollie, who escort them back to Estoros' house for questioning. There they meet grave mystic Weaver Vudal, who casts Speak with Dead on Estoros. She learns that he was killed by by Odahan Thule two days ago and that he wishes to be interred next to Mistress Prudage. With their innocence confirmed, Bell's Hells say their goodbyes to Lord Estoros. Following arrest, they head to the docks where they speak with Captain Xandus, informing them of the change of ownership of the ship. The ship is still undergoing repairs, so they spend a day stocking up before heading to Eos via the Hellcatch Valley with a plan to look for the Gorgonite along the way. After a few days of travel, Chetney, Fern, and Oram are out on the deck at night when Ruidus begins to flare and Chetney uncontrollably turns into a werewolf, attacking them. They fend him off until the flare ends and he transforms back to his usual self. This is a very unusual incident given that it is usually Cartha, the Silver Moon, which controls Lycan transformations and not Ruidus. At the same time, Imogen has another Red Storm dream where she comes face to face with her mother who says she needs to run. Upon waking, she casts Sending to her mother for the first time, expecting no response, but she gets a word back. Imogen? Episode 40, Compulsions. Imogen casts Sending to her mother again, and her mother can also cast Sending, so they have a conversation back and forth. Liliana refuses to tell her where she is, and again emphasizes that Imogen needs to run, and she should not try and follow her. Imogen tells Liliana that she is tired of running. The group reconvenes, and Ashton brings up how they could all turn on each other, and in fact, many of them have turned on each other already. Aram is frustrated or maybe angered by this conversation, and leaves to head up to the deck. There, he messages Dorian, filling him in on the latest events. Ashton checks in on Aram, reminding him that he needs to take care of himself as well as everyone else. Ashton also shares some of their experience with chronic pain. After a few more days of travel, they encounter a chimera, and during the combat, Imogen uses a new spell where she summons a red entity with long, elongated features. It does psychic damage to anyone within its radius. Imogen is just as surprised by this summoning as the others. She doesn't know where this creature came from. Arriving at the Gloam Jungles, Chetty shares that he was bitten by a wounded werewolf while out hunting, and he managed to kill the werewolf. A group of blood hunters arrive on the scene and told Chetney that he must learn to control his new abilities or he will be taken care of. Chetney wants to learn from the Gorgonai how to control his curse, especially given his recent uncontrollable Ruidus transformation. In the jungle, Chetney and the group howl into the distance, summoning the Gorgonai. There is a were-tiger, were-panther, a were-bear, and a were-boar, and two werewolves. The were-tiger is the leader, Divashila, who Chetney was told to seek out by Ajit Dayal. The group is taken to the Lycan village of Baranak, where Divashila reveals her true name is Annaline, with the name Divashila acting as a kind a password. Chetney shares what happened with the Ruidus Flare, but Annaline says none of the Gorgonai have experienced this themselves. While proper training to control his abilities could take weeks, Annaline says that Chetney can seek out the spirit of Sahayadon, an avatar of Saratani, the Marquesian name for the Wild Mother. They will travel to a temple of Sahayadon, where Chetney and his friends will undergo a trial. Episode 41, Call of the Wild. Bell's Hells set out with some members of the Gorgonai through the jungle to the temple. The group encounter some large twilight tigers, but by shifting into their lichen forms, the Gorgonai manage to scare them off. While resting, Chetney demonstrates some of his bloodhunter abilities for Annaline, who is unimpressed and is a much more prodigious bloodhunter than him. She does teach him some advanced skills though, and she shares how she became a lichen. A lichen was delivered by mistake to her uncle, as it was supposed to bite someone else, but instead it bit her. This 
lichen was called Dereo. She also shares that her mentor, Amitho, who founded the Gorgonai, eventually gave in to the beast because they no longer wished to fight against the curse. She warns Chetney about giving in to this urge and making sure to always stay in control. They arrive at the temple which is built into a cliffside and inside the chamber is a statue of Seratani. Chetney sits at the statue and reaches out to Sahayadon and as he does so, the moon rises and a moonbeam pierces the temple through an opening in the roof and a spirit arrives. The spirit questions Chetney and then possesses the Gorgonai who stand as guardians for this trial. Chetney again feels an uncontrollable urge to transform and when he does, he has a larger and much more formidable lichen form than usual and he turns on his friends and attacks. Bell's Hells spend time both attacking Chetney and trying to emotionally reach him, reminding him of their friendship. Eventually, with a clever use of the darkness spell on the moonlight from Lordna and Ashton just telling Chetney to knock it off, they are able to reach him and he transforms back to his usual self. The spirit speaks to Chetney saying that it has taken the scar of an unworthy predator and left her own in its place, and the group see Ruidus's red energy leaving Chetney's body. Chetney thanks Seratani and streaks into the jungle with Bell's Hells to celebrate, but as Aram lingers behind, he notices the faint smell of his husband Will, he places his sword inside the statue's scabbard and removes it with a blessing of Seratani as vines wrap around his blade and it glows green. He then heads off to join the others in celebrating. Episode 42 the City of Flowing Light. The next day, the group say farewell to the Gorgonite, with Annaline explaining that while Chetney is not yet a fully-fledged member, he is an ally, and she also reminds the group that they need to help Chetney carry the burden of his curse and help him control it. While waiting for Captain Xandus to pick them up, FCG learns some cooking from one of the Gorgonite. This is the beginnings of FCG taking the chef feat. Annaline also shows Ashton some new moves with the hammer, and Fern teaches Lordna some fire magic. Oren practices using his new sword, which he names Seedling, the Wayward Pilgrim. They arrive at Eos, which is a city built over a huge lake in rings. The lake's water glows blue in the evening, giving the city its moniker of the City of Flowing Lights. They land at the Lake Cap Skyport and Lounge and head into the casino where they partake in some gambling and meet a man called Landon Creshall, who they hire to be their guide to the city for the next day. While most of the group has been relaxing and enjoying cocktails and shrimp, Imogen has been tense and anxious, surrounded by so many people for the first time in a while. In their room, Chetney draws Imogen a bath and encourages her to relax, but instead she casts fly on herself and flies out the window, soaring over the city where she messages Liliana who again encourages her to stay in Eos. But Imogen keeps pushing back. After some time she returns to the room. The next day with Landon as their guide they head to the Aidenland Seminary looking for three people. Firstly Khadija Sumal, the author of the study that Liliana was in, two Ebenold Kai of the Grim Verity and three an automaton expert who might be able to tell FCG more about themselves. Once they arrive at the seminary they hear a bird cry and a very strange and mangy bird FCG's long-held nemesis, Shithead, swoops down. Episode 43, Axiom Shaken. The bird, Shithead, tries to well, shit on FCG's head, but Bell's Hells take the bird down. However, Chetney senses that it's undead and it begins to heal itself. Using Speak With Animals, FCG asks why it keeps following him and he says, if I'm here forever, I'm making myself everyone's problem. Shithead flies away and Pete tries to follow but can't keep up. After this, the group realize that Ashton is just gone? Imogen sends a message and Ashton says that they're dealing with some stuff and will be back later. Inside the Adolin Seminary, the group ask the clerk, Karel, to see Ebenold Kai, but she informs them that he cancelled all of his classes and hasn't been seen for a couple of months. However, they can return tomorrow to meet Khadija Sumal. To the consternation of everyone, a giant muscular figure enters the room wearing an eyeless metal mask and armor covered in runes and symbols. Fern recognizes this as a judicator from Vasselheim, warriors who have undergone some process or ritual to become guardians and hunters for the church of Vasselheim. The group concludes that they are here looking for the texts that were taken by the Grim Verity. Because she refuses to give them any more details, FCG casts friends on Corel and coerces her into taking them to Ebenold Kai's house. On the walkover, Corel reveals that she has stolen some of the things from the seminary to sell and they use this information to blackmail her into staying silent once the spell is up and she realizes what happened. Ebenold's home appears to be abandoned, so Chetney and Aram sneak in, noting traps on the windows and doors. Inside, Chetney can smell the scent of fear. He lets the others in and they discover a secret staircase into a basement. There they find two figures who are in the process of casting a teleportation spell. Bell's Hells run into the teleportation circle, going with them. They arrive in the fire plane with the two figures who are Ebenold, Kai, and Dr. Baron Vestichio, another member of the Grim Verity who specializes in the founding and the schism. This is an outpost of plane rider Rin, a tiefling who has been 
working with the Grim Verity. Ebenold worked with Liliana in the Ruidus Born study and recognizes Imogen to be her daughter. With introductions done and tensions out of the way, Baron explains that she and two others were the one who discovered the text referring to the two previously unknown gods. These gods were called Ethodoc, the Endless Shadow, who controlled the domain of winter and darkness, and Vordo, the Fate Shaper, who controlled the domain of fate and order. These two gods were consumed prior to the schism by a being known as Predathos, which came from beyond the stars and hunted the gods. The gods and the primordial titans carved a piece from Exandria and imprisoned Predathos inside it. This prison became Ruidus. Rin has been studying the ley lines and movements of celestial bodies and noticed that flares of Ruidus were impacting them. She is also aware of the constructions being built in the Fey Realm and the Shadowfell. The group conclude that Odahan is probably an exultant, which is a Ruidus born who has stronger powers, a stronger connection to Ruidus, just like Imogen, and that Odahan is drawing Ruidus born to her to build an army. Bell's Hells want to help and discuss with Rin ways that they can. She suggests that they attempt to sabotage the devices in the Fey Realm or the Shadow fell, so Imogen sends a message to Fern's grandmother, Nana Mori, who was in the Fey Realm, asking if she can help. She says she will in a very creepy voice. Rin teleports Bell's Hells back to Ebonod's basement, where they hear figures above them searching the house. Episode 44, Bawdy Basement Belligerence. Bell's Hells try and decide if they should fight or flee, and instead they choose to pretend to stage an orgy. <laughs> After the searching figures, who turn out to be in red cloaks and accompanied by an air elemental, bust down the door, the party pretends that they are engaged in some adult activity in the basement. <laughs> Oren pretends to be the bouncer for this soiree and tries to convince them to leave, but one of them notices Imogen's lightning markings on her arms and combat is initiated. They defeat the intruders, taking one, an elementalist mage, hostage, and they quickly leave the house using Fern, wild-shaped as a horse, to carry their hostage out. They head to the docks where they find an empty warehouse to question the mage who is called Taldus. He reveals he is part of the Ruby Vanguard, a faction headed by Ludinus Daleth of the Cerberus Assembly. This vanguard wants to release Pradathos so that it will consume the gods and set mortals free from divine intervention. Odahan Thul is a prominent figure in this organization, and he also confirms that the devices are called Malleus Keys and that the last one has been finished. They message plane rider Rin, who arrives to take Taldus for further questioning, and after arrest, Imogen messages Ashton, letting them know it's time to meet up. Episode 45 ominous lectures. The group meet up with Ashton at the Adolin Seminary, where he is magically disguised as a human in disheveled chef whites. Here's what happened. They spotted a person from their past called Violet, who specializes in finding people. Assuming Violet was here to find Bell's Hells, Ashton slipped off to intercept them. Violet was not there to find them, but Ashton accidentally <laughs> slipped out some valuable information, which Violet then used to blackmail Ashton to come and do a quick muscle job involving some mobsters, a fight in a kitchen, and a Kenku. It all worked out, and the bad guys were arrested. Inside the seminary, FCG and Laudner meet with Professor Vitro Isham, a specialist in automatons who confirms that FCG is a harmonious aeomaton, a kind of an aeomaton who acted as diplomats and guides. The professor is unable to determine if FCG was a murder bot from the Karen Culling event, but does note he has a larger arcane power core than is normally required for his form. He also mentions that if detonated, this power core could cause a huge explosion. And lastly, he modifies FCG's body to include an oven where he can bake little snacks as part of his chef feat. Meanwhile, Imogen and Fern visit Khadija Sumal, who is very suspicious and hesitant to let them in. They eventually convince her, and she shares that she headed up a team that created the Omen Archive, which tracked and documented notable Ruidus born. Liliana was the first exultant that they studied, eventually finding 12. These exultants dreamt of being on the surface of Ruidus, where they encountered beings called Rylora, Crimson figures very similar in description to the one that Imogen summoned aboard the Skyship. The Rylora are all different, with some being kind and curious and helpful, and others are angry and malicious and demanding. Odahan Thul was also part of that study, but she seemed to be gathering information about the Archive and always wanted to delve deeper into the dreams and the powers more than Khadija was comfortable with. Odahan left the study, and it was shortly after that Grim Verity members began to be assassinated or taken. The Omen Archive was recently confiscated, but Khadija managed to save some papers which she brings out to show Laudner and Imogen. These papers contain the name of every known exultant in Exandria, as well as detailed information on the movements of Ruidus and its flares. Just at that moment, Ludinus Daleth walks in and immediately casts a spell on Khadija, potentially feeble mind, and she hands over all of the papers. Ludinus recognizes Imogen as Liliana's daughter and says her mother has been an integral part of the Vanguard's efforts. He says he's been aware of Bell's Hells poking around and invites them to come and join the cause. He also reveals that despite it being around a thousand years ago, he was present for the calamity. <laughs> he expresses anger and disdain for the gods, saying that mortals are the ones with the power. He then leaves and Fern and Imogen are left with Khadija, who is still under the effects of the spell, 
Imogen messages Rin, who teleports into the office and says she will get Khadija to safety, and she then opens a portal to the Fey Realm for Bell's Hells. They step through and find themselves in a swampy landscape with strange flowers and twisted trees, and Fern leads them to her grandmother's house. Nanamari comes out to greet them, and we get our first glimpse of her, a towering figure around 10 feet tall with a large round torso, a long neck like a giraffe's. And when she opens her clothes, she reveals that she has another face on her stomach. Tummy Nana, who also welcomes them. Episode 46, Night at the Ligament Manor. Nanamari describes herself as a watcher. She watches others and will sometimes pluck on or add a tangle to the threads of fate that bind mortals. Nanamari tells them they can easily find the Malleus Key by following Ruidus in the Fey Realm sky, for it sits directly above the device, which is located inside the Unseelie Court's Shiver Keep. Fern takes the group on a tour of the manor, starting with her bedroom, which seems glamorous and lavish on first look, but on closer inspection has a morbid undertone, with everything made out of stretched skins and strange paintings and dolls and puppets hanging from the ceiling, and like over the window there are iron bars. She also shows them, with Nana's permission, the collection room, where Nana stores all of her prized curios and collectibles, all of them creepy and downright horrifying in some instances, including the still-beating heart of the Lion Guard, a champion of the Fey Realm. They head out to the garden where there are topiaries of humanoid figures in twisted shapes with the sound of a heartbeat emanating from them. Out here they meet Sweet Pea, a talking sun bear and childhood friends of Ferns. They retire to Avado and begin an exchange of all the information they learned at the seminary, getting into a bit of a debate about the gods and whether or not it is a bad thing for them to be gone. Aram reminds them that the Vanguard murdered his family and so whether the gods are good or not is sort of besides the point. The Vanguard are murderers. FCG casts Cher Dream on Imogen and he and Lordna join her in her dream. This time she actively seeks out her mother and they find themselves at a large pit, an excavation site where the Malleus key is, and there they see people busily working on it. Imogen finds Liliana who tells her she has to go and forces her out of the dream. The next day they prepare to set out for the Shiver Key. Nana gives them three Harakul veils which can allow them to be unseen when standing still, and gives Fern a beautiful breastplate. On their journey there they meet Dr. Nesbitt, an owl-like creature, and another of Fern's childhood friends. They also encounter three centaurs who attempt to capture them to take them to the Unsealy court, but the group managed to subdue them and escape. Episode 47, The Fey Key. As they approach the Shiver Keep, they see several towers with white marble needles stretching up into the sky. When Lordner sends Pate to investigate, he is outlined in the fairy fire spell once he passes the threshold of the tower, which seems to be a part of some defensive network around the Shiver Keep. While this is happening, they hear an awful screeching in the distance from a large winged creature, ominous foreshadowing. Using Pate flying above, they are able to approach the keep without setting off the fairy flyer. Finding themselves at the walls of the Shiver Keep, Lordner and Aram invisibly spy to climb up the walls and over the other side where they see the Malleus Key in the center with a red beam of energy tethering it to Ruidus above. Chetney transforms into a werewolf and distracts the guards, and with the clever use of the banishment spell, Bell's Hells trap both of the guards in the portable hole, and Chetney and Ashton don their armour as a disguise. Then they see Odahan Thule exiting the keep next to a tall fey, Sorry Lord Zathuda, Grove Captain of the Unseelie Court and boss of Erika Ishii's character Yusuf Aid. The two argue about timelines or something like that, and Odahan teleports away while Zathuda summons that large winged creature, a fey dragon dragon called Gloomglut and flies away. Lorna and Aram, still invisible, get to the Malleus Key with Fern who is wild shaped into a slow Loris. They investigate the interior of the machine but they can't find a way to sabotage it so they decide to overload the arcane cores connected to it to cause an explosion. Attracting the attention of everyone in the courtyard, they begin their assault until the cores detonate and the Malleus Key is destroyed. Ruidus vanishes from the Fey Realm sky and Bell's Hells hustle out of there, chased by the Unseelie forces as well as Gloomglut who knocks several of them unconscious as they try to run. Through through some spells and stealth checks, they manage to get out to the forest where they use the Harrowcore veils to hide from Gloomglut. Episode 48, An Exit Most Fraught. Bell's Hells cower in the forest, trying to avoid the laser gaze of Gloomglut. Using Catapult to throw a large boulder, Imogen manages to distract it, giving them an opening to race through the forest. Imogen messages Nanamori, telling her that they need help, and while she doesn't respond, she does turn up in the form of a huge bird creature which slams into Gloomglut, fending him off. They arrive at the exit to the Material Plane, which is guarded by a creature with a cyclops eye and multiple arms that it uses like a spider. Hated that, didn't like it at all. This creature is Tarosh the Lidless Slumber, who speaks only in rhyme. 
The party have to offer him a gift and also speak only in rhyme before he will allow them through. Before leaving, they hurriedly smear on some paste which Nanamari gave them to help prevent too much time distortion during the crossing. The paste works and they find themselves on the other side of the portal, conveniently near Imogen's hometown of Jelvin. Imogen messages Rin informing her of their success and Rin shares that there is another team working on the Shadowfell key at this very moment. However, her message is cut off abruptly mid-message and they don't hear from her again. Imogen is extremely reluctant to visit her father, but the others convince her, saying that he might know or have something that could help them reach Liliana. Imogen, joined by FCG, Laudner, and Chetney, dreams again, this time focusing on Rin. She is drawn to the excavation site where there is a lot of hurried movement. The Vanguard are busy burying arcane cores and fortifying their defenses following the destruction of the Fakey. And there they find Rin petrified, turned to stone. Odahan Thul is there too, and she notices the psychic presence of Chetney and FCG before they wake up. After a long rest, Imogen messages Keyleth, learning that the Ashari are at Terra, the home of the Earth Ashari, because there is trouble at the Earth Elemental Rift, which might be connected to the Vanguard's plans in Marquette. They head to Jelvin and find Imogen's father, Relvin, working at the stables. It is a very tense and awkward reunion. Imogen presses him for more information about Liliana, and he relents, explaining that a year or so after Imogen was born, her dreams and powers started increasing increasing, and Liliana was worried that this would happen to Imogen too, and that's when she left. Relvin gives Imogen a locket with a tiny fingerprint inside, and the words, the better halves become a better whole. The skyship arrives, causing a stir in the town, and Imogen flies up to it, looking down at the townsfolk who treated her and Lordna so badly, and they fly off to the Hellcatch Valley. Episode 49 the Aurora grows. As Bell's Hells travel in their skyship, they notice a faint glowing energy in the sky, a magical aurora caused by the shifting ley lines and approaching Apogee Solstice. There's also a kind of static in the air, a faint buzzing that some members of the group can sense. The party contact Ira, asking if he'd like to get in on the action to destroy the Malleus Key, and he agrees, so they plan to pick him up from the Callaway layaway. They also contact Imahara Joe, asking him to make a bomb, Fern's parents, who will pick up the bomb, Gianna Hexum, who gives them a contact for some supplies in Bassaras, and Ebonold Kai, who, since Rin is petrified, is stuck in the elemental plane of fire. Aram also reaches out to Dorian, but Dorian is having troubles of his own. Apparently, Opal is getting kinda dark. They also come up with a pretty crazy plan. They plan to crash the skyship into the Malleus Key to destroy it. In a Red Storm dream, Imogen speaks with her mother, who says if the Vanguard succeed, mortals will be free, demonstrating that she is all on board with this cult's plan. Laudner prods Ashton for more information about their past, and they share that they have vague memories of an accident, waking up in the desert, and the word Hishari. The whole reason they joined up with Bell's Hells is because they heard Aram say Ashari. Ashton is quite bitter about their past, but says he is going to try and focus on protecting his friends, especially FCG, who he is worried is going to attempt to sacrifice himself. FCG reaches out to D, likely Devexian, the Aeomaton that the Mighty Nine met in Campaign 2, who says that FCG can make their own path now. Arriving at the Callaway Layaway, they pick up Ira, and he tells them that the Malleus Key at the excavation site releases an anti-magic pulse every minute, and that there are more fortifications and adjustments being made. Through the seed that Oren received at Noodle Pock in EXU, Keyleth sends a message, explaining that the Vanguard had infiltrated the Earth Ashari, and that a Dark Heart Behemoth was released which the Ashari have been dealing with. The culprit responsible, Vurio, got away. Keyleth says she will bring the cavalry to the excavation site, just message when. Episode 50 Red Moon Rising. Bell's Hells prepare for their approach to the excavation site and inform Xandus of the plan to crash the skyship. They plan to drop the crew off somewhere safe, but Xandus agrees to stay on the ship. They decide to split into two teams, the ground team, which is Ashton, Chetney, Aram, Lorden, and Imogen, who will try and infiltrate the site by foot, and the sky team, which is Fern, FCG, Xandus, and Ira, who will set the ship on a crash course and then hopefully jump off just before. The ground team disguise themselves as members of the Ruby Vanguard and Paragon's Call and begin the journey. On the way, they find the remains of a crashed skyship from Vasselheim, suggesting the Vanguard have anti-skyship defences. At the edge of the pit, they encounter some cultists and a large automaton called a Warder. They manage to defeat them, but then Imogen is silently grabbed by a mysterious figure who pulls her into a tent. This person is Beauregard Lionette, Marisha's character from Campaign 2, and accompanying her is Caleb Widogast, Liam's character from Campaign 2 as well. After a bit of a tense and hostile standoff, the two groups realise that they're on the same side, and Bo and Caleb share that they've been keeping an eye on lewdness for some time and trying to gather evidence about his shady behaviour. They've also been working with Rin and were on the Shadowfell team. They've been staking out this site and observed a mage hunter golem patrolling as well as the anti-magic field, which is being powered by two devices. Bo and Caleb are worried that Ludness is expecting an attack since he's been getting sloppy, potentially trying to lure folks in purposefully. They hatch a plan. The two groups will sneak down to the key separately and meet up down there to try and avoid detection. 
But first, they need to deal with the downed automaton so that they won't be discovered. Episode 51. The Apogee Solstice. We check back in with Team Sky on the skyship. Ira, using a wacky telescope, notices that the Malleus key is missing a lens, a very important detail for later. FCG messages Aram checking in, who says that they need hand with the downed automaton, so FCG and Fern head out on foot, trusting Xandus and Zyra to set the ship on a crash course. The two teams meet up, and FCG manages to hotwire themselves into the automaton, controlling it from the inside. There's enough room in there for some of the party to hide, while Imogen pretends to be a Vanguard member, and Aram pretends to be a prisoner. Heading down into the pit, they pass General Ratanish, who doesn't recognize them, and tells them to be on the lookout for Vasselheim forces. As they get near the bottom, they see people placing potions of possibility inside the machine, as well as installing them in Odahan Thul's backpack, confirming the long-held fan theory that she was getting her Echonite abilities from Dunamancy potions. At the base, they find a small cavern where a power core is hidden, along with some guards, who the party dispatch fairly quickly. However, Odahan Thul starts heading their way. Imogen decides to face her, but before she can, there is a explosion which catches Thul's attention and the the anti-magic field is dispelled, presumably by Bo and Caleb. It's at this point that Ludinus himself appears. Meanwhile, FCG inside the automaton is pretending to be doing some work, but accidentally knocks some rock onto Rin's statue, breaking off her arm. Ludinus dispels the automaton, leaving FCG trapped inside. Then, disastrously, Caleb is captured by the mage hunter Golem, and Bo is charmed by Liliana, with both of them brought before the key so that Ludinus can begin his villain monologue about how the gods are unnecessary and how they feed on and manipulate mortals who should be free of them. He places his arm inside the machine, which opens up to reveal a Luxon beacon inside. He uses some of his own life force or essence to power something inside the machine, and the world around the key turns as hours pass by in seconds. He's sped them up through time. The Silver Sun comes hurtling towards the key, but Ludinus throws up a shield and the ship is destroyed, leaving the key unharmed. Xandus and Ira luckily teleported off safely. Imogen pleads with her mother to make this stop, but she tells her that it's too late. As the Malleus key begins to power up, it draws energy from all of the surrounding Ruidus born, including Imogen and, to a lesser extent, Fern, when suddenly Keyleth arrives as a Kidior, an earth elemental that slams into the ground. Caleb and Bo's instincts were right though, as Ludinus was prepared for her, and this is a trap. He casts the ninth level spell power word stun on her, and Odahan strikes her over and over and over again. She is about to go in for a killing blow when a man appears, wearing a cloak of feathers. That's right, it's the champion of the Raven Queen, Vaxeldan himself. The party rallies and starts to attack Odahan's backpack, hoping to disable her dunamis powers, but as the Vasselheim forces arrive, Liliana casts a spell on Vax, perhaps imprisonment, and he is contained down into a small black sphere, which Liliana telekinetically places inside the machine. Vax was the missing lens. A beam of red energy shoots out of the key and the sky erupts into an explosion of colors before everything turns white. As the light fades, Lordna, Asher, and Orem find themselves in an unfamiliar landscape with a sulfurous smell and acidic pools. FCG, Fern, Chetney, and Imogen find themselves in a totally different location, which Chetney recognizes as being near his hometown of Uthodurn in Wildmount. And that is where the episode ends. Whew! And if you want to know what happens next, check out my in-depth breakdown of episode 52 right here, and you can see all of my campaign 3 breakdowns in this playlist right here. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like, and I hope you will consider subscribing. It took me a really, really long time to make. I've been filming for what feels like a million hours, and it really does help show the YouTube robots that my videos are worthy. Until next time, bye!